Hiya, Majin Wai, Sarsha Ansha, Tamaj Nakakanili. So this is the the stone of McNeely here in Clackanili and near Falkara in County Donegal, Ireland. So I wanted to uh, do the reading today from um, a couple of books and tell the story of Clackanili and McNeely and Lou and Balor. So I know you've heard of Balor of the Evil Eye and Lou of the Long Arm and so we're going to tell a bit of the story and the books uh, I wanted to talk about is this one here is a free book that's available from the Clackanili School which is just right here um, and it's called Fado. Uh, so Fado Santau Shachira or the story of Balor and Lou. Um, they just put this out recently. It's a very nice wee book. It's in uh, Gaelic Agus Berlisha. It's in Irish and in English, so um, you can read it both ways. And that's a good one. And I would normally read from this one, but um, it's a bit long. So this story here is Donegal Folk Tales, and this is by Joe Brennan. And uh, so this story is a little bit more detailed. It's a wee bit different version of it. So every time you tell the story, there's a wee different story uh, version to it and wee changes. So, um, you know, I listen and read all of them. So this one you can get at Schoenberg's here in Falkara if you come to Donegal. Uh, I don't think it's available online. This one you can get online, but I'm not sure. I think you can definitely get it from the Kenny's bookstore and, and places like Schoenberg's here. Let me mention this. This is the clock. The clock. That means stone in Irish. So that's the clock. It's clock on green. So that means it's a quartz, so it's a quartz stone. And you can see that it's up about 16 feet. So um, the reason that it's up is back in 1774, uh, a little bit before the American Revolution, Olfert, who's a Dutch immigrant there in the plantation era, uh, he owned the property over at Mali Connell, or Bally Connell Estate, uh, which is over that way. And uh, so he put the clock of Neely up on this pedestal here um, back in 1774, and it's been up there ever since, so that's why it's there. So, Shabagantin Shkal Clock of Neely as Gaelic. Fado Fado, Jerer and Chankash, we baller in a re are hori. Tugu baller no sula neva, our shikar, Garashi Abba to Rudy a Rosanna ill. Kiroch Balar Bone and Glass Gavon or E Nomnachine are here more. Hui Makunilu Unyar Nabo, a Karchi Jolchas, Dinistri, Donak Murphy, Ain Dinner, Balar Nasula Niva, Ach and Daro Ain. Sarsha here, and uh, I'm going to read from the book of uh, Donegal Folk Tales, and that's by uh, Jill Brennan, and you can get it online. It's a really good book. I highly recommend it. And behind me is Tory Island, and that's where Balor of the Evil Eye is from. And so if if you were here, it'd be and you're in front of me right now, it'd be right behind you. And if you look that way, that's north for me, and that's where Tory Island is. And it's only like 12 kilometers that way off of the Drumna Chinny Beach there. We we'll call it Falkara Backstand. So anyway, um, so we'll go on just, here we go, reading from the story. And the days of yore, a time fire back out of the reach of chronology. There flourished three brothers, Gavida, Mac Sahan, and Mac Keneally, who lived in Shere Connell. The county we now call Dinegal, or Dinanal, County Donegal, on the lands looking over the fierce Atlantic. The first of the three, Gavida, was distinguished blacksmith who held his forge at Drumnachene on the parish of Rafinon. The name was a reference of Gavida's forge, Drumnachene, translates as in Irish as the Ridge of the Fire, and that's the Backstrand Beach right there. And uh, McAneely 
was the lord of the district, comprising of the parishes of Rafinon, Tolochabegli, and he possessed a cow by the name of Glass Goblin, and was said to be so lutiferous, lactiferous, that's one of those big English words, <laughs> means that it gave a lot of milk. It actually could feed a lot of counties. So um, let me go back to that. Uh, lactiferous, that she was covered by all, coveted by all his neighbors, and many attempts were made to steal her. As a consequence, McAneely found it necessary to watch her constantly, day and night, and keep her at his side at all times. At this time, in the same remote period, there was an island called Tori, which you see right there behind me, uh, lying in the ocean opposite of Drumna Chimney, the home of the smith Gabida. Tori received its name from presenting a tower, uh, towering appearance from the continent uh, of Chirkono, and was many prominent rocks towering into the heavens, which are called Tors. So he's talking about these towers right there. That's Ballard's Fort there. And those are the rocks that we're talking about. There's a whole slew of them over there. On the east side, that's the east side. So I think it was, uh, yeah, east. Here flourished a famous warrior named Balar, whose very name struck terror in the hearts of the hearer. He who should not be named, it starts with a V. <laughs> he was a giant, or a giant of a man who had one eye, possessed of, of a terrible power. The eye was a deadly weapon that had a foul and distorted glance and was kept covered at all times. When its lid would be lifted up, it would emit a terrible beam and dyes of venom like that of a basilisk would strike any living creature dead. Legend had it that when Balor was young, he was passing by the house when he was attracted by the sound of chanting. Despite knowing that this was a forbidden place, as the magicians, the, the Driyacha, uh, where they gathered there to work their new spells, his curiosity got the best of him, and he climbed up to the window high on the, the wall. And at first he could see nothing, but his eye adjusted and he saw a room was full of fumes and gases. As he poked his head further into the gloom, the chanting grew louder and the strong plume of smoke hit Balor in the face, and he was blinded by the poisonous fumes and could not open this one eye. He dropped to the ground where he wreathed, wreathed in pain. Before he could escape, one of the three came out of the highest, and the druid came round to Balor and realized what had happened. He was surprised that he wasn't dead. That was the spell of death, and the fumes have brought the power of death into your eye, said the Dree. If ye look on anyone with that eye, they will be petrified. And that was how he got his terrible power and his name. When among his own people the eye remained shut, but he would turn its steadily power onto his enemies, and they would drop dead. As he grew old, it is said that the eyelid grew so heavy that he could not open it by himself, but needed help. An ivory ring was driven through the eyelid, and ropes were attached to the ring to pull the eyelid open. It took ten men to lift it and to release its murderous venom. But in the process, ten times that number were slain on a single glance. Hence, to this day, people call an, e an evil or overlooking eye by the name of Sowalar, Balor's eye. Despite this terrible power of self-defense, it had been revealed to a druid that Balor would be killed by his O, or his grandson. Balor had only one child, a daughter named Etna, and he realized he recognized that his destruction would only be brought about through her. So he shut her up in an impregnable tower, which he himself or some of his ancestors had built. Some time before, the tower was on the summit of Tor Mor, a lofty, almost inaccessible rock shooting into the blue sky, breaking the roaring waves and confronting the storms at the eastern extremity of the island. Uh, they say it's the eastern part of Tori here. Along with his daughter, he imprisoned 12 matrons to take care of her. You must never allow any man near her or give her any idea of the even the existence or nature of that sex he commanded. Fair Etna was imprisoned within the walls of the tower for many, many years, and knew nothing else of the world except for the glimpses that she caught through the window at the top of the tower of passing clouds and birds and waves rolling on the sea, pounding on the cliffs below. The matrons attended to Etna 
making her life as comfortable as possible, and tradition has it that she blossomed into a great beauty. The matrons were ever on their guard, not to mention the word man or let slip any remote reference to that sex. For while they did not understand or indeed agree with the nature of Balor's command, they followed it to the letter for fear of his wrath. Despite all these precautions, Etna would still question the women about the manner in which she was brought into existence and the nature of the beings that she had occasionally glimpsed passing up and down the sea in Korakas. She often related to her dreams of other beings, other places, and other enjoyments which sported in her imagination. But the matrons stayed faithful to their trust and never offered a single word of explanation of the mysteries of that enchanted her imagination. In the meantime, Balor, feeling secure in his existence regarding the prediction of the Druid, the Druid continued his business of war and plunder. He performed many deeds of fame or infamy, captured many vessels, subdued and cast in chains an adventurous band of sea rovers, and made many descent upon the opposite continent, carrying with him to the island men and property. But despite all his victories, his ambitions could not be satisfied until he should get possession of that most valuable cow, the glass goblin. Therefore, he directed all his powers of strength and stratagem towards his goal. And one day, Makinili, the chief of the land opposite Atari, and the owner of the prize cow, Glass Goblin, went to visit his brother's forge in Dramnachene to have some swords made. He led the cow by the halter, which he constantly held in his own hand by day and by which she was tied at night to keep her from the scheming hands. When he arrived at the forge, he entrusted her to the care of his other brother, Maxalkanan, and who was also there on business connected with war. Keep your hand fast on that halter, for ye know how precious she is to me and how many would love to take her away, he said, while I go within to watch the shaping and stealing of my sword. Do you take me for a fool, brother? he asked. I will protect her like my own. Maxahan lay back against a tree, enjoying the sun high in the sky, while he was cooled by a breeze wafting off of the sea. Balor, who was ever watchful for a chance to steal away the cow, saw an opportunity to fulfill his desire. He turned himself into a fair Bokorua, red-headed boy, and made his way innocently to where Maxahun lay resting with his firm grip on the cow. Are you getting a sword made too? he asked. I am, said Maxahun. In my turn, when Makanili comes out to guard the cow, I'll go into Gavida and get my sword forged on steel. That's what you think, said the red haired boy. I heard them talking in there at the furnace, and they are using all their steel for their own swords to make heavier weapons, and you'll have none. Of course, that did the trick. Maxon jumped to his feet and, in rage, stuffed the halter into the red haired boy's hand. Take hold of this, my red headed friend, and you'll see how soon I'll change their minds. As soon as he turned us back, Balor turned himself into his own hideous self, and dragging the prey's cow off by the tail, hurried to the strand and into the sea, taking his ill-gotten gain safely back to the island fortress. The place where he dragged the cow into the sea became known as Port Naglasha, the harbor of the glass or the green cow, or the gray cow, to commemorate the deeds of the day. When Makanili's brother entered the forge, ranting and raving, he knew immediately the Maxahan had been tricked. He raced outside to witness Balor dragging glass goblin behind him across the sea at great speed through the water, and within the shortest of times he watched the cow and the man fade into a mere speck across the sound of Tari. It was Makanili's turn to be angry now, and he turned his rage on his brother. How could you be such an idiot and be so stupid as to be tricked so easily, he ranted. I gave her into your trust because all I thought you had the sense to see such scantily concealed trickery. Maxon realized the error he had made and suffered a few boxes on the head from his brother without complaint. 
which probably helped avoid a major falling out among the brothers. McAneely wandered about for several hours, distracted by his passions, and it was not to be consoled in any way for his loss. But rant and rave as he might, the fact that he had lost the cow, the cow was gone, it was a terrible blow. Eventually, the brothers were able to persuade him to consider what could be done to recover the gloss. With his passions vented, he went to see a druid who lived in the area. He'll never recover the cow as long as Balor is living, for he will be ready with his deadly basilisk's eye and will petrify any man that could venture near her, said the Dree. McAneely wasn't to be thwarted in his efforts to recover his cow, so he went to Birog of the Slivcha, the Lananshi, who undertook to aid him into bringing about Balor's destruction. She dressed him in the clothes of women for the age, and the Birog called upon the powerful wind and wafted them both across on wings of the storm across the sound of Tori to tour more where Etna was imprisoned. She knocked up loudly on the door and demanded admittance. Help! Please help us! My companion is a noble lady whom I rescued from the cruel hands of a tyrant who had attempted to carry her off by force from the protection of her people, said Birogi. Despite Balor's wish not to admit strangers, the matrons did not want to refuse help to another woman in distress. They also sensed a great power at the hands of Birogi. So they let her and her companion in. As soon as they were inside the tower, Piroga cast another spell, a pishog, and put them and all the matrons to sleep. Makinili cast aside his women's clothes and made his way to the top of the tower to find Etna. He found her, staring out the st at the stars with the sadness cast about her. She was the most beautiful woman he'd ever laid eyes on, and when she turned, she beheld the figure that was familiar to her from her dreams and thought about her imaginings all day long, a face that she loved dearly. Declaring their love for each other, the, uh, you know, they instantly fell in love. Of course, they embraced with delight. They lay down together at that night, and when Biroge wife did Makinili to an enchanted, on an enchanted wind the next morning to drum the chimney, Etna was with child, the grandson of Balor. Etna was devastated. The next day, when Makinili was gone and her grief wasn't helped by the fact that the maidens tried to convince her that all that had happened that night was a dream, or a dream of a dream. She, despite this fact, they told her to mention nothing of it to Balor. And so things continued until the day that Etna gave birth to three sons. When Balor learned the birth, he was furious and filled with dread, and he recalled the dream's prophecy and he ordered that the three boys be taken from their mother and drowned. Despite Enya's pleading, the three baby boys were snatched from her, and they were wrapped in a sheet that was secured with the jug or pen. Balor had ordered that they be cast into a certain whirlpool. As a bundle had been transported across the harbor to its deadly pool, the jug fell out of the sheer. Onto one of the babies fell into the water and disappeared beneath the waves. The other two were secured and cast into the intended pool as ordered by Valor. The harbor to this day is called Port Ajelic, the harbor of the pen. Valor was delighted to hear the children had drowned and the prediction of the dream was thwarted. But unbeknownst to all, Vieroge had been riding the winds that night and had seen the boy fall from the sheet. Instead of sinking to the bottom of the harbor, as was reported to Balor, the boy, the firstborn, was wafted secretly by Birogya across the sound to the mainland. She brought the boy to her father, Makanili, who sent him to be fostered by his brother, Gavila, the great blacksmith. Balor quickly learned from his druid that Makanili was the man who had made the great effort to set the wheel of destiny in motion. Balor made his way across the sound, landing on the part of the continent called from some more modern occupier, Balikano, the Czech Balikano, and the band of his fierce associates seized upon Makinili, dragged him to a large white rock and laid his head upon it. One of the band held his head there by the long hair while the others held his head, hands and legs. Balor raised his ponderous sword high above Makinili's neck and brought it down with the fearsome force that cut his head clean off with one blow, the blood flowed around him in warm floods, 
and even penetrated the stone to the center. The stone with its red veins still attests to the story and gives its name to the location of this deadly affair, Clacanili. The boy was brought up by his uncle Gavida's trade, which then ranked among the learned professions and was deemed of such much importance that Brahid, the goddess of the po poets, thought it not beneath her dignity to preside over the smiths also. The boy prospered at his uncle's side, growing to become an accomplished smith, gathering much wisdom from the furnace side. The great and good came far and wide to engage his uncle, and as the work diligently by the fire, the boy listened carefully to all that was discussed. It was often he who heard of the deeds of Balor, and believing he had baffled the fates by drowning the three baby boys, ventured forth into the mainland carrying on his misdeeds without fear of opposition. Indeed, he even employed Gavida to make all of his weapons. He was unaware that the boy at the fire was Makinili's heir, his own grandson, who had in him the power to slay Balor. He watched the lad grow into a fine, strong young man and an excellent smith. Indeed, Balor became greatly attached to him, ignorant of his power to have the will of the fates executed. Now, the son of Makinili was well aware of the fates of his father at the hands of Balor, and was acquainted with the story of his own birth and the escape of destruction. He was often observed indulging in gloomy fits of despondency, frequently visiting the blood-stained stone Clochanili to return from it with a furrowed brow, which nothing could smooth. One day, Balor came to the forge when Gavida was away on some private business, so all the work on that day was to be executed by his young foster son. In the course of the day, Balor happened to mention with great pride his conquest of Makinili. The furrows on the boy's brow this deepened as Balor continued to boast about his killing and looting. Suddenly, the boy grabbed a glowing rod from the furnace and thrust it through the basilisk's eye of Balor and out through the other side of his head. In one swoop, he had avenged his father, slain his grandfather, and executed the decree of the fates, which nothing could avert. Some accounts claim that this took place in Nakvola, the bloody foreland, but others who place the death of Balor at Dramnachene account for the name Nakvola by making the scene of the bloody battle between the Irish and the Danes. However, tradition errs as to the place of Balor's death, for it is recorded in the mythological cycle that he was killed by his grandson Lu in the battle of Montura when the Chir de Danan defeated the Fomorians, of whom Balor was the king. Lu then became Ardri of Erin, or the High King of Ireland. So, I've also heard the story that the battle took place in uh, Glen Neva. So, that's the, the Poison Glen, which is on the other side of the Derry Bay Mountains, behind me, uh, well, in the picture here. <laughs> it's behind me this way, but... Yeah, what's the background there? So anyway, it's, it's south of where we are now at Drumna Chinni. So um, anyway, so there's that's why the Poison Glen has its name because the poison eye bleeded bled all over the, the glen there. Um, of course, there's other uh, stories about the name there too. So anyway, that's the story from Denigal Folk Tales by Joe Brennan. Uh, it's very good. Some big words, but a lot of good place names. Hope you enjoyed it. Shinega Fall. Slananus. <laughs>